So here in front of me, I have what I think is probably going to be the last revision of the Sur 5 series from B-Link. But this is the Sur 5 Pro with the Ryzen 7 5700U. That is an 8-core, 16-thread, Zen 2-based APU. Now, the configuration that I have here in front of me is with 16 gigabytes of RAM and a 1 terabyte SSD. Now, we've taken a look at practically every other revision of the Sur 5 on this channel before. So what I'm curious is, where exactly does this stack up in comparison to the rest of the product line? In general, things like the IO have not changed much at all between all of the different revisions. The only things that will be slightly different is that some of them will have more USB 3 ports than others, but in general, they're all kind of configured the same. They all essentially have the same number of ports. They're all one gigabit. And in general, they're pretty standard for what you get in this price point. Really, again, the only differences are going to be exactly how many USB 3 ports you get and whatever the display configuration is going to be, whether it's dual HDMI or HDMI plus display port. Now, there are slight differences amongst the body designs of all of the different Sur 5s, though it's just small revisions that get done in between all of them. But of course, we do have an 8-core, 12-thread Zen 2-base CPU, and this CPU at this point is quite a few generations old, with its original revision being the, the 4800U, so at this point it has been quite a few years. But these are still readily available on the market with new systems coming out with this APU even to this day. So let's actually jump in and look at what the performance numbers are like in comparison to all of the other ones, at least in the CPU side of things. Right off the bat, taking a look at Cinebench R23, we can see that the 5700U falls almost identically in line with the default Cinebench number for the i9-9880H and the Ryzen 5 6600H that is actually on the original version version of the Sur 6. Now both systems have a default TDP of 35 watts. This is significant because of the fact that the 5700U by default on most systems will have a TDP that ranges anywhere between 25 watts down to 15 watts. So B-Link have manually configured this out of the box from the BIOS to actually go up to 35 watts. And this is a welcome addition for sure, though it does introduce more system noise. What's interesting though, is that even though it does have a lead in terms of multi-core performance in comparison to all of its siblings with Ryzen 5s, it's not exactly a earth shattering difference between the two. Those extra two cores certainly are doing something, though it isn't really making this leagues better in comparison, at least in terms of, again, CPU performance. The single core performance does actually show some improvements, but it's nothing substantial, and it does actually still get beaten out by all of its Zen 3 based siblings, though it does keep up with them significantly more than the 5500U does. But in general, it still falls behind to pretty much every Zen 3 based CPU that I have numbers for. Now, in comparison to the Sur 5 Max, which has a similar eight core CPU, but this time it is Zen 3 based and it is an H series processor with a maximum TDP out of the box of 54 watts, we see some pretty massive gains in terms of the multi-core performance to the point where if you're actually doing CPU bound workloads, the difference here is astronomical in comparison to the price difference between the two systems. The 5800H just really hits a sweet spot where you get almost the same level of multi-core performance as something like the 7735HS, which is usually in systems that are around $100 to $150 more expensive, and you really don't see another massive leap until we go to the 7800HS. And if we compare the 7800HS to the 5700U, well, here we're seeing such a large difference in terms of performance that we're almost looking at doubling the level of performance here. And this is again, eight core to eight core comparison, but we're comparing 35 watts to a system with a stock TDP of 70 watts. So those eight cores are getting really well fed and it really shows in comparison with the stock clock speeds just being significantly higher. It's why if we took the 5700U and pumped it full of 80 watts, its performance is not going to close the gap by any means because 
by default, it just has a lower maximum clock speed. And of course, since it's based off of Zen 2, it can't exactly get anywhere near 5 gigahertz, let alone 4.5. In general, the CPU results aren't exactly that impressive. And if the CPU is something that you really care about here, unless you really need those extra cores and you know that you have a workload that will benefit from more cores than faster individual cores, there really isn't much of a reason to get this over something like the 5800H or the 5560U. The main reason why I wouldn't recommend this over the 5560U is just that the 5560U still gives some decent levels of multi-core performance. It actually has better single core performance, which is going to matter for day-to-day -day tasks more. And the system is dead silent in comparison to this version where the Sur 5 Pro because of its higher 35 watt TDP just makes noticeably more noise when it's actually being pushed. And if we're going to have a system making noise, well, you might as well go with the 5800H because then at least you get the benefit of a much faster CPU. The, the difference in terms of GPU is going to be a lot less noticeable. But we will be testing the system in comparison to a bunch of these systems individually so we can actually go in depth for the comparisons. So for now, those are just the general numbers that I got there. Let's jump into the GPU performance where here there is actually a bigger difference. Now the first game that I actually tried on here is Conan Exiles, mostly because my friends and I have been playing this game on our own dedicated server for a couple of weeks now, and uh, I've sunk a lot of hours into this. In the last two weeks alone, I've put in over a hundred hours into this game. So I was hoping that it would perform well on here. Unfortunately, I had to drop things down to 720p to actually get this to be at a playable frame rate on here. Of course, once I did go down to 720p, the performance was actually really fantastic. Where at 1080p, I was looking at more of a 30fps average. Coming down to 720p means that we are consistently hitting an above 60fps average and our 1% lows are very close to 60. And while the drop to 720p is disappointing, the fact that you're actually able to play the game on here is pretty impressive. And if you're actually interested in picking up the game, you can actually get the complete edition of it right now off of Uplay, and that is Y-U-P-L-A-Y. I actually recently picked up the complete edition so that I could get all of the DLC and I only paid it. $38. In comparison, pretty much everywhere else, the complete edition is going to cost you twice to sometimes as much as 3x what I paid for. For example, during the Steam Christmas sale right now, the complete edition is $100. And if you own the base game but none of the DLC, you're still looking at spending almost $100. So check out the link down below to Uplay if you want to pick it up and of course if you want to help support the channel since it is an affiliate link but it is a site that I personally actually use, so I can definitely recommend it. Thankfully though, Conan Exiles was pretty much the only game where I had to actually drop the default resolution, at least without having to use something like FSR. Here in Batman Arkham Knight running with the built-in benchmark with the lowest in-game graphics settings except the textures being set to their highest, the level of performance that we're looking at here is going to be close to around a 30 FPS average. Now one thing you should pay attention to is our power usage here. Now you saw that I mentioned that the stock TDP is 35 watts, so you might be wondering, well, where is that extra wattage? If you look at the GPU clock, it's already maxed out. And a title like this is not going to need eight cores. It's pretty much only going to be utilizing one, maybe two at most. And so if the GPU is already reaching its maximum clock speed and it's pretty much reaching full utilization and the game's only using two cores, well, we don't need 35 watts. It's why even if we pumped this system with say 45 watts or 50 watts or even 100 watts, the game's not going to perform any better because the limiting factors right now are the maximum clock speed for the GPU and the maximum clock speed for the CPU. So 30 FPS is about what you should expect out of this system at 1080p in this game. But really, with more modern games, one of the best features that a lot of them come with is FSR. 
Now, FSR is very controversial because of the fact that it just doesn't look as good as DLSS. And some people really seem to just hate the idea of upscaling games just to get them to be playable. And I can understand that sentiment if you have a 4090 and you need DLSS just to get something like Starfield to even get remotely playable, even though that game is extremely CPU limited. Still, FSR has been a saving grace for a lot of these really low end systems because it pushes titles that would otherwise be at the edge of playability or really just past the point of being playable and it brings them to a level that is actually pretty enjoyable and personally speaking i really don't care about the impact to the visual quality if i can actually play the game now that's kind of a blanket statement that doesn't hold true all the time because there have been some really bad implementations of fsr but at least with tiny tina's wonderland as you could see with fsr set to the performance preset we're getting some great levels of performance and the art style really lends itself to this lower resolution that's being upscaled. In general, in motion and during actual gameplay, it really doesn't bother me at all. And the level of performance that we're getting really overall justifies the usage of FSR. Of course, there's only so much that FSR could actually do. And at the end of the day, if your hardware just is not powerful enough, even the much lower resolution of FSR is not going to be able to keep up. And here you could see Assassin's Creed Mirage running with the lowest in-game graphics settings and we are using FSR at the performance preset and the level of performance that we're getting here is still very disappointing. As you can see, the GPU is fully utilized, it is reaching its maximum clock speeds, and it is essentially just the thing that is holding us back here. We're actually almost even using the full 35 watts, so the CPU is definitely being put to work more than most other games, but if you see its utilization, it's still not even reaching half. So we're not using anywhere near the full eight cores. It's just that it is using more than just the standard two, and it's definitely making them clock a little bit higher. That's why we're seeing the higher power draw in general, but that GPU is pretty much maxed out already, and it is what's holding this game back. You can even see this in Returnal here, running with the lowest in-game graphics settings. We are running the built-in benchmark, and we're using FSR at the ultra performance preset which is just not recommended to use pretty much ever unless you're using like a 4k display because at this resolution we're pretty much running the game actually at a resolution of around 360p and even with such a low resolution we are still running into a gpu bottleneck here that is not even letting us get close to a 30 fps average this is an extremely demanding game in general and because it is so much more recent and it's really bringing down an older chip like this to its knees and Vega really just is not able to keep up at all. Our CPU really isn't doing much at all because it's just stuck waiting for that GPU most of the time. So in general, there's not really much you could do to actually get this to a playable range since we're already essentially rendering the game at 360p. Now I did also test out Guardians of the Galaxy here running with the lowest in-game graphics settings except the textures are set to the high setting. There's pretty much only a low and high setting for texture, so it's set to the high, and we are using FSR at the performance preset. And like this, we're able to get a tolerable 30 FPS, and I say tolerable only because the 1% lows will dip down, and the built-in benchmark doesn't show it, but while you're actually playing the game, there are going to be the occasional stutters here and there as things start to load in. Considering that this is a single-player action-adventure game, it's certainly not a deal-breaker, but it's not a ideal either. This is definitely one of those where personal preference plays a big factor on whether or not you're going to be able to play it. Now, a game that is a frequent flyer here on the channel is, of course, Rainbow Six Siege. I like testing this because with its lowest in-game graphics settings and using FSR at the performance setting, we tend to get some fantastic levels of performance on these Vega-based iGPUs. It's really a great result, and overall, I don't feel like FSR really destroys the visual quality enough that you can't play this game. Of course, if you're an extremely competitive player, you might find it to be visually difficult to see enemies at very long ranges, but you do have some headroom here where you can adjust the FSR settings to your liking, though just know that you are going to be taking an impact in terms of your performance. You're not going to get a above 100 FPS average if you bump up FSR up to quality, but it's still going to be a very playable experience, and in general, it is a joy to play this game on all of these mini PCs. Of course, not having access to FSR in a bunch of older titles that are still 
somewhat demanding can actually lead to situations where you're not getting the most ideal level of performance. Here with Strange Brigade, which is one of the first games to actually come out with support for both DirectX 12 and Vulkan, here testing it with the Vulkan API, we get some pretty decent levels of performance, though if we could utilize FSR even at the quality or balance preset, we could pretty much get this a lot closer to a 60 FPS average and we might even be able to hit it above that. As it stands, it's not exactly a bad experience, but it does show that there is an era of gaming where it is still kind of demanding on these Vega iGPUs while not having access to features like FSR to essentially salvage it. Of course, there are FSR injectors out there that you can use, but one of the biggest downsides of those is the fact that UIs do not scale properly. What a lot of games that use FSR do is they actually will not affect the UI at all and will only upscale the actual gameplay itself without messing with any of the UI so you don't get any blurriness to text or anything like that. Now, the last game that I wanted to actually take a look at for this video is, of course, PUBG Battlegrounds running with the lowest in-game graphics settings except for the textures set to high and the view distance set to epic. And the performance like this was okay, but those 1% lows really were the thing that dragged down the experience overall. For a competitive game like this, it can certainly be a problem to try to aim at people when your 1% lows fluctuate a lot like this. What this means is you're going to get essentially a lot of latency and it could pretty much end up getting you killed. I certainly would not continue to play the game like this, but PUBG fans always really seem to have a different level of tolerance for performance. So it really comes down to your personal preference. So we took a look at the system running a lot of kind of demanding games. I realized just going through the list of the titles, a lot of them were going to be extremely difficult for a chip this old to actually keep up with. But but I think that it's more than adequate to test with hardware like that considering that this is a brand new system being sold right now. Now one key thing that I do need to point out to you guys that might matter to you is the fact that Vega based iGPUs are now essentially considered legacy even though they're currently still being sold right now in brand new hardware. And I don't just mean these chips right here that are essentially just leftovers from manufacturing over the years. I'm talking about brand new 7000 series branded CPUs that are Vega based are being sold today and their drivers are now considered legacy drivers. They'll still get security updates and things like that, but there is no more optimization being done for Vega whatsoever. So what this effectively means is that if there's any problems whatsoever with any brand new titles out there, don't really expect a fix. Maybe AMD will throw you a bone, but don't expect it. And that does put a damper on what is otherwise a pretty decent product. Though I think that the performance numbers that we got here essentially point towards two different directions. It's such a middle of the road product that it doesn't really excel at anything because the 5560U in the current version of the Sur 5 that was released along with this, yeah, you get slightly worse multi-core performance, but unless you're really doing a workload that is actually going to push all eight cores to their maximum, that's really not gonna matter to you, especially since the 5560U actually has higher single core performance which means that in day-to-day -day tasks, the things that the vast majority of people out there are actually going to be doing, it is objectively a faster system. And considering it's cheaper, runs at a lower TDP, and essentially because of that produces less noise, it really is the far more ideal system for the vast majority of people out there. If you need CPU performance, the 5800H in the Sur 5 Max is a meaningful upgrade over this to the point where if CPU matters to you, spending the extra 50 to $80 to get that system over this is gonna be far more worth it. Now, if the GPU is what matters to you the most, then there is a far more compelling argument here because of the fact that this is still a Radeon 8 that is eight full Vega cores which is the maximum that it would go to by the end of Vega's life cycle essentially which is still going on to this day by the way I want to point out that there are still brand new chips being released with Vega 
And yes, those are just refreshes, but again, they're still being sold as brand new products. But because they're just refreshes, they do only cap out at eight Vega cores. So you're getting that here with just a slightly reduced maximum GPU clock, which is not going to make a meaningful difference here, but it is a pretty noticeable jump in terms of the performance that we get with the 5560U. And we're going to do a head to head comparison between the two coming up so you can actually see what the performance is like. But as it stands, this system, I really can't recommend it for the vast majority of people. I feel like if you just need a day to day system that is going to last you a very long time that you're just going to use for your daily computer usage, get the 5560U. It's just the overall better product for the vast majority of people because the extra performance of this system you will more than likely not utilize and it will just be a louder system that you paid more money for. And if you do need that extra performance, the Sur 5 Max is not that much more expensive and it has a meaningful upgrade. Now, of course, there are vastly more expensive mini PCs out there that will give you varying levels of increases in performance. But in terms of the iGPU, this is about as good as it gets until you get to RDNA. So if the GPU really matters to you all that much, well, this isn't that bad of an option. But again, we'll also be doing a direct comparison between this system and the Sur 5 Max. So stay tuned for that. But overall, I think that the other systems in the family have just far more compelling options to them that I really can't see too much of a reason to get this. You won't be disappointed if you buy this system. I think the only way you'd be disappointed is if you really care about sound. And it's not like the system is egregiously loud in comparison to other mini PCs. It's just the fact that the Sur 5 with the 5560U is just that quiet, where I think a lot of people will struggle to really make that sacrifice if they just knew how much quieter of a system it would be for effectively the same performance and even sometimes just better. So it's definitely something to consider there. But stay tuned for those upcoming videos. Be sure to subscribe and again, check out that link to Uplay if you wanna pick up Conan Exiles Complete Edition for an extremely cheap price. I'll catch you guys next time.